it's uh, good to be on with so many uh, so many people here today. Uh, so, like Jamie said, you know, as chief administrators, we spend all day working with uh, the procurement director or the CIO or you know the the HR director, or the personnel director, and so that's why it's so important for NASCA to have these relationships uh, with these other associations. Much like you know, I, I like I say, I talk with those people every day. Uh, it makes sense that we would have a close relationship and that we would align our priorities uh, with these other associations. And, you know, whenever we get the opportunity, we like to help each other out. So again, like Jamie said, I just want to thank everyone for being here with us today to go through this panel. And with that, um, we're just going to jump right in and we're going to do just a quick round up front. We're going to give everyone on the panel um, one to two minutes. Um, to just quickly, uh, you know, introduce yourself and talk about your agency, uh, your mission, your priorities, um, and bit, just very big picture, um, how your industry and your members' priorities have changed since COVID-19. And again, I, I will warn you, it is one to two minutes. I'm told that Jamie has a virtual shepherd's hook, and she will pull you if you talk too long. So Jamie, get your hook ready, and we will start off with uh, Brian DeForest. Uh, representing NASCA. All right, thanks, Brom. Uh, so I'm Brian DeForest. I've been in state government now for 29 years, spent 10 years in banking systems ahead of that. Uh, I, I'm a, the chief administrative officer at the Department of Administrative Services, which is the right hand executive arm of the governor. And I think I'll just start with, you know, how have things changed? Uh, as with most admin services agencies, we're all things to all people. And even more so now, we become the glue in between all of our major programs and fill in the gaps where they cannot. And we do that because we've seen a little of everything, um, like the State Farm commercial. We've seen, we've seen a few things, and so we know a lot of things. Um, and our agencies that couldn't pull off some of the uh, more difficult tasks in our response, we were able to just come in, be that glue or that uh, putty, if you will, and fill in all of the gaps. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that because I don't want I don't want that shepherd's hook around my neck. <laughs> I hear it's really uncomfortable. Thank you, Brian. Um, next, we'll we will go to um, Dennis with Nasio. Good afternoon, everybody. Um... Great to be here with you all. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to share some ideas with you today uh, from the perspective of the state CIOs. Um, I joined state government in New Hampshire back in 2015 after being in the, in the tech sector for my whole career doing either um, leadership in software companies of the IT function or doing commercial software development. So huge culture change for me going from, you know, software company to state government, but I find that I love it. You know, the city, you know, citizen service is extremely motivating and that's a different kind of motivation than say stock options or uh, restricted shares, but really great. Uh, the, the, the biggest changes we've seen, um, with the, you know, with the, the uh, uh, COVID effects really have been, uh, pace. Uh, the pace of everything has just exploded and you'll you'll hear some more about that um, when we talk later in in this uh, in this event okay thank you Dennis Dennis I heard you say that the uh, motivations are, are different than stock options you didn't say better or worse you just said different did I yeah there's there, there's pluses and minuses and uh, <laughs> you know I did have to learn how to live on less money I, I'll tell you that for sure all right thank you Dennis <laughs> Um, next up, we will go to Franklin with NASPY. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Franklin Placeville. I am with the uh, state of Washington. Um, and uh, thank you, NASCA, for inviting us to join. Uh, we really value the relationship we have with NASCA. We work closely with Jamie and the team. I hope that statement softens the pull of the hook if I do crosswise with her. So uh, it's a little self. Um, anyway, um, uh, my role, just a little bit about my role, is um, we're responsible for kind of statewide HR policy, including in our state collective bargaining, um, civil service rules, and the classification and compensation structure. I think collectively uh, at our state, and as course of NASPE, what we can do to ensure that we have a highly qualified, diverse workforce that meets the emerging needs of our of government and citizens that we serve um, is really what we're all about. COVID, I you know I. Remember the phone call in, in Washington, we were kind of one of the first reported cases of a death around COVID-19. And I remember that phone call uh, late February on a Sunday saying, you know, the first death at Life Care Center in Kirkland happened. And um, 
nothing's quite been the same since then. Um, you know, and, and I think I'll never be the same. And I don't think many of us will be. Uh, it's been an incredible um, experience. I think that from this, we've learned how to work across our teams. Uh, many of the peers, peer groups that are on the panel with us and that many of you on this call are on this meeting, um, we've had an opportunity to really learn to work more and more together, more efficiently, uh, bring innovation, um, and be, be okay with being uncomfortable, being a little more in the uncertain has really pushed us in new ways. Um, and uh, really excited to talk to you a little bit about that and share more of my experiences and what we at NASPI are doing as well. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, next, we will go over to George with NASPO. Thank you, Brown. I, I definitely appreciate that. These um, last couple of months certainly have been uh, professionally fascinating and uh, unexpected, certainly, in, in both the positions that I've held as the, the president of the National Association of State Procurement Officials. We're a, a member services organization, um, uh, colleagues with, uh, with NASCA and, and others on the, on the call. Uh, you know, expected this year certainly to have uh, quite a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, professional um, uh, development uh, that was gonna, gonna take place this last year. And it has really been uh, instead uh, leading a, a weekly uh, call with, uh, with state CPOs and contemporaneous uh, issues, um, really been able to, to build partnerships with the FBI and the Office of Federal Procurement Policy and, and others um, on contemporaneous issues. So it's been, been very different than, than expected. As the Chief Procurement Officer of the District of Columbia, I've uh, been in that role for five years with uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser. Um, again, uh, very, uh, very unexpected, uh, very unexpected times. Uh, from the, the first calls uh, at the end of February uh, in the sustained operations that we've uh, been able to maintain. Uh, working successfully with our emergency operators and with our health department to to bring uh, you know the, the goods and the services and the, the hospitals uh, that we services that we've needed to the district has been very different than uh, than I would have expected certainly. Okay, great, thanks, George. And last but not least, we will go over to Hope with the state facilities administrators. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for in, including me and our organization in, in this uh, presentation. Um, I've actually been a career employee with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for 30, over 35 years. And uh, uh, it's always been changing, but this has been a huge change. Um, my agency is uh, within the cabinet structure of the chief administrators. Um, what we do is major capital construction. We do real estate acquisitions and dispositions, and we also manage and maintain uh, many of the central state uh, agency office buildings. And um, I would say that uh, some of the biggest changes that we've seen uh, is how do we use our office building? How do we use our spaces? You know, um, people thought they'd be, this would be a, a somewhat of a shorter duration. We'd go back to normal, whatever normal was. And now we are really just peeling back the, the onion or pulling this, the curtains back on the state and saying, wow, there's a whole lot of different ways to conduct business now in the state. And so we are constantly, we've been touching base, of course, interacting with HR and technology and, you know, all the different aspects of how we touch people in our buildings. And uh, I'd say that the biggest change is thinking that, um, well, actually, you can empty a building out and do a renovation project, and you're not going to necessarily lose productivity because, uh, in fact, you might be able to get your project done a little faster, and you can still get your work done, which has been a bit of a, a surprise, but uh, one positive outcome in a, in a sea of un, un, unhappy events. Okay, thank you, Hope. Yeah, we're finding in Michigan that our uh, our in you know construction projects within buildings are going really fast now because you don't need swing space anymore it's really nice right all right well thank you all for introducing yourselves i'm glad we didn't have to get the shepherd's hook out i guess uh, jamie can save that for my 30 minute monologue uh, that we'll do at the end of this session um, but we are going to go into one more just a little bit of warm-up with our panel here before we get into some more in-depth questions um, we're gonna do a speed round and so we're gonna ask you each a different question and ask you to answer it uh, in one sentence. And you get bonus points if you can actually answer it with just one word, but we'll give you a sentence. So I'm gonna start with Franklin. 
And you know, all of these, all of these questions are over the last few months, whatever. So Franklin, we're gonna start with you. Over the last few months, the best value your agencies, and so those are HR agencies across the country, offered to others was? You put me at one word, um, no, uh, humanity. And, and I guess what I mean by that is uh, that I think that we've held space for a human experience and a human impact perspective of these incredibly difficult situations we have, whether it is the COVID-19 response, the larger social justice conversation, how do we bring these incredibly impactful things that are touching our lives at home, at work, and how we can think about how we can support our employees and leverage resources across other areas. Not close to one word, sorry. <laughs> I started with one word, but I had to explain it, so yeah. that didn't work. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it, thank you. All right, all right, Dennis, you're up next. Uh, over the last few months, the governor's phone rang most often because because citizens, businesses, and the press have an insatiable desire for information and direction as it relates to the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, agree. Okay, great. Um, Hope, over the last few months, the biggest conflicts or competing interests were? Uh, masks, and <laughs> I would say um, the dynamic between uh, trying to be efficient with energy and having appropriate ventilation in our buildings. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, next, over to George. Over the last few months, your best friends were? Uh, Brahm, I think you're asking me the, the trick question because procurement officials are not supposed to have friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, you know, the fire chief and our health professionals that were the experts in PPE that were some of the first phone calls that we made to really understand what we needed to get into, uh, those are the friends. Good, good answer, thank you. All right, Brian, uh, over the last few months, I had to keep the governor informed on. I had to keep the governor informed on a lot of bad news, uh, a lot of mistakes that were made, and how we could turn all of those lemons into lemonade and give her some positive outcomes from government that she could share at a very personal and local level. Yeah, the great answer. You know, that's what we find is what, you know, we're finding that with our staff in Michigan as well. They just, they really want that personal interaction. You know, we do, I do, um, you know, every other week live videos where I just go on with all of the employees and they don't like it when it's scripted. They like it when we just get on and we really have that personal interaction with people. Yeah. yeah. Every corner of the state wanted to know that they were heard. And as yeah. long as we could give that anecdotal information, uh, it just built credibility with government. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Well, there we go. The speed round is over and we are going to dig into some uh, more meaty questions here. Um, because we have a limited time and we do have a number of great panelists here, um, we're not going to ask every single person to answer each question. Um, we have identified a couple folks uh, to, let's say, direct the questions to, but obviously other panelists, if you, you, know, if you have a thought, you know, please jump in. Um, so we're going to start out with this first question, and we'll ask um, Brian and Franklin uh, to both weigh in on this, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll let Brian go first since he's already up on the screen here. Um, so most of the, you know, those of us on the call, um, we represent you know, the critical administrative and operational functions. Um, how have your operational agencies collaborated, coordinated, you know, uh, recently, and have any of those relationships become more strategic as a result of the last few months? Yeah, uh, we're, we're somewhat unique in Oregon. Well, I guess we're, maybe we're not unique, where we, we keep the program agencies, you know, kind of at an arm's distance from the administrative agency. Uh, and let them set policy, operate their programs and whatnot. Uh, but what we found is as direction came into those program agencies, operationalizing the governor's instructions became kind of tricky. And uh, as soon as we got into a cadence where the program agency picked up the phone and called DAS and said, here's my assignment, how can you help? Then we were able to, to, to kind of 
make the connections across program lines or find the unique local stakeholder or most importantly engage procurement at a very positive level and and so we made those connections for folks we filled in gaps and we uh, I, th I think the most effective thing is is we were just able to connect people that knew the answer uh, and and be very honest uh, with our sister agencies. We don't know the answer, but we know exactly who you need to contact. And uh, what we found is uh, operationalizing instructions moved from you know seven to 14 days down to seven to 14 or 24 hours. And uh, we also uh, encouraged people to move forward as soon as you have 80 percent of the solution move forward and get it moving and then adjust as you go as you implement so that that's that's kind of what it's been in my experience yeah that's great um, franklin do you have some thoughts on this thank you and, and i think brian and i are in similar roles it sounds like that um maybe it's about being out in the west i don't know but there's definitely a decentralized federated environment we have so in my hr role specifically for washington HR directors also reside at state agency levels. So I don't have that kind of, you know, direct line. It's more a matter of influence and collaboration within the HR community to start with. And certainly as we move out further to our partners and for instance, uh, Director Liu, uh, Chris Liu, who is a uh, DES, Department of Enterprise Services in Washington. Um, you know, he has part of our HR functions in terms of some of the operational service sides for the recruitment system and training. Um, and uh, certainly our partnership on the procurement side uh, was important as we navigated the, um, the past few months. I think that there's a dynamic that we were all responding to a public health crisis that we as a leadership kind of group across all of these different lines of work um, had a commitment to following the science, doing the best we could to keep people safe um, to model the right behavior as how we should act as an employer, as an organization, to be thoughtful in how to respond and navigate uh, the health crisis we had, um, and now even the budget situations we have going forward. Uh, I think certainly COVID provided this moment where we could all work together towards a very common goal that if you try to think about collaboration and think about how you can work together more effectively, it can get theoretical fast and people can kind of get a little less reality-based. I think this crisis, this moment, called for us to reckon with a reality we had in front of us and work together in ways that we hadn't before. Um, and I just really am excited about how we can seize that and go forward as we move into very difficult conversations going forward around our budget, structure of government, continuation of services, that we continue to have these incredibly strong relationships that were in place before, but we moved out of kind of that transactional role to really like, this is a problem no one could have imagined over hundreds of tabletop exercises. Um, how do we do this together? And I think it really invited us to be more strategic and also to be wrong sometimes um, and be okay with that because we had, um, I think as Brian has said, 80% is probably as good as you're gonna get sometimes um, of certainty. Um, and so in some ways it invited maybe a little more vulnerability. It invited a little more kind of just openness that I think, um, I think really is, actually put us in positions where there's more trust. Certainly there's times that we have, um, you know, uh, conflict's a strong word, but you know, challenges of navigating things. But I think fundamentally we have this momentum that I'm excited about how we can proceed because we're not out of the woods on the health issues. We're certainly not out of the woods on how we as an organization respond to larger social conversations. And we have our work cut out for us on the budget ahead of us and some really tough decisions. And so I'm really excited about those relationships, whether it's with facilities, procurement, um, or our budget uh, partners, which I think are an important part of kind of the overarching policy when it comes to this, um, are, you know, just to name a few, are I think so important to um, really build. And I'm really grateful for the relationships we had before, but just how much they've expanded since then. Yeah, that's great. I suspect a lot of us have shared that that same kind of experience. You know, we we, we joke as as you know central service agencies. A lot of us are control agencies. We're the ones that have to tell other people no, right? And so you know, a lot of the time we joke about you have to have thick skin to do this. But what I've seen, at least my experience, is we 
we're appreciated a lot more over the last six months than, than yeah. we are usually, you know, a lot of other agencies where we had a partnership, but all of a sudden they realize, oh, wow, you're actually you're doing this for us. You know, you're carrying 90% of the water on this issue. And, yeah, so and we nice. care. Yeah. And I think that there's times where we can be, that we can be marginalized to like check the box mentality or just, you didn't follow the rules that's coming back to you. I think that they saw us as people that saw other people as people, um, not issues or, you know, processes, and that we had to do the best we could. And I think that I remember the times we were trying our best to get guidance out in early March, and it was just liberating that you had these moments of people like say, I, I get help us with something and then we'll work with you on it. And I think that it just, it, it invited this kind of thought process that I don't think, I think we all want to have, but we don't, sometimes we can hold back a little bit on. I think this cri this crisis kind of actually caused us to open up a little more. So I didn't yeah. catch off, but uh, yeah. Um, but yeah. So. Yeah, good, thank you. So I think that, I mean, that's actually, that leads right to our next question, this idea of everything, you know, we, we joke, everything has changed over the last five months. Every, you know, our relationships have changed, the places where we work have changed, our focus, the people we work with, you know, everything. Um, and so, uh, we, you know, we've just covered a lot of the changes that have happened um, but I'm going to ask next Dennis uh, and George to weigh in on um, of the changes that you've seen in the last five, six months. Um, what, what are those that you would most like to see sustained? So the changes that have happened because of COVID, whatever they were, what are the ones that you would most likely to sustain after COVID? And so let's go to Dennis first. Thank you, Brom. Um, I'm going to uh, base my answer on uh, some some data that um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, farmed out of the, uh, the NACIO Planning and Response Guides for State CIOs, which is published on the NACIO website. Um, right off the bat, um, uh, we have been engaging state CIOs on COVID-19 response, and um, so we actually got some real uh, some real uh, comprehensive national information on what's been going on on states, and there's a, Real a, a lot of consistency. Um, one of the big ones, as you might, you know, as you would be no surprise, is you know, work from home, um, and and what are the options there? So we, you know, first of all, we we are more productive than we expected to be um, in many ways, and part of that's because the, you know, the, the flexibility around hours and things like that, which are we're a very uh, uh, New Hampshire is very union state, so there's a lot of control. Uh, uh, tradition there that we had to throw out the door. Um, openness to positive business process changes in the work from home context. For example, everybody that had a printer or could print felt they needed a printer at their home. But so far we haven't, we've uh, almost all uh, the uh, at home folks are working without a printer now and more efficiently than they were before because we said, hey, think about your business process. In fact, I heard earlier people talking about, you know, electronic signatures and electronic processing of documents. You know, that's so much more efficient than pushing paper. So, and then, of course, potential savings on facilities costs, which hope, hope will, uh, will love and hate, right? Because, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on a budget shortfall and facilities is one place I'm going to start attacking and, and do less of that, you know. So uh, another big area is... We've been delivering citizen uh, experience solutions way faster. Starts right out with quicker procurement. So you all love to hear that. I mean, way quicker procurement. Part of that is, you know, part of that is, you know, the governor's in a, uh, declared a state of emergency. He has the, the emergency powers to help move things along. But, I, but uh, there's also better overall collaboration throughout the branches of government. And so that procurement piece has really been helped by that. Uh, very fast decisions on requirements, and then very impactful is the agile approach to project management and development that's been inside the delivery of those citizen service exper uh, citizen experience solutions. And finally, uh, to call out a big one is uh, the, the positive progress in, in the unemployment insurance space. We want to keep moving that along. Now, every state's in a different place there. Some of them are still pretty hurting, and some of them are a lot better, but we're not where we need to be. Uh, claims processing and adjudication are, are a big deal, but also the digital services that mitigate call center, you know, it's called deflection, that kind of stuff. So those, that's a small piece. So I really would encourage you if you're interested to go take a look at the NASIO website. There's a lot more information there and that's where I'll leave it. 
Okay, thanks, Dennis. Well, George, uh, Dennis is talking up faster procurement times. So, what do you have to add in this? <laughs> That's good stuff, Dennis. That's good stuff. And, you know, from a from a uh, from a NASPO perspective, it's it's getting contemporaneous information out uh, in a in a real time manner, and uh, you know, and it, it's keeping that. It was necessary with COVID. So the the weekly calls, but but getting out uh, tips on fraudulent companies on how are we buying uh, uh, how are we buying ventilators how are we buying quarantine sites how are you dealing with uh, with call centers and you know what are the best practices and the clauses that are uh, that are contemporaneous there uh, so being able to we've had to uh, adjust and pivot and and really get information out quickly to members and being able to continue to do that I think is um, is a reality. On the, the district side, um, you know, the emergency operations centers uh, and the, we have uh, obviously a, a, a number of, of uh, urgent issues that happen a year in the district, whether it's an inauguration or, or First Amendment uh, uh, um, projects that happen downtown. So we've, we've always had that structure. Being able, and, and for short periods of time, being able to continue the warehousing efforts that we've developed uh, to be able to holistically bring in uh, the goods for health and for PPE and for hospitals uh, and disperse them and having the data around that is something that we certainly have have honed uh, over the last number of months and uh, a practice that we want to continue. As an aside from a, a human resources perspective, um, the, the tools that we've had before that we've really been able to use for, for collaboration and for networking, whether it's with our client agencies or whether it's with industry uh, to, to negotiate contracts, um, we have really, uh, I've seen uh, you know, across the states uh, and, and huge increase in use of those tools and uh, really being able to um, make, the, make the most of them to, to continue the services that we all do as public services public servants, uh, but, but doing it in this new environment. Okay, thanks, George. Sure. Um, and so from that, so that's, we're talking about what we'd like to sustain, but I'm sure there are some other things, other changes that we could talk about here, whether we want to sustain them or not. And so we'll go there next. Maybe we'll just stick with you for a minute, George. Uh, this question is for George and Hope. Um, well, let's say, you know, what's the most unexpected or interesting um, change, whether that was welcome or unwelcome, <laughs> change related to COVID. Yeah, I, I think um, managing, uh, you know, the, the eight billion dollars of contracts in the district every day is a is a uh, is a new fascinating um, adventure. I tell you, the something that has been very heartwarming and uh, and truly um, impressive to me over the last number of months have been the businesses that have uh, have pivoted and. You know, distilleries that have moved to uh, to developing hand sanitizer, uh, tailors that have moved to cloth masks, uh, industries that that had supply chains uh, outside of the country and were able to to uh, pivot to, towards that to to bring in uh, the goods on their planes um, that that were needed here. Uh, that was extremely impressive, um, and uh, you know, truly. Yeah. Hope, how about you? Well, I think, you know, the, the, one of the most welcome things is just all the collaboration that's just been encouraged and really uh, everyone's sort of been all in on, both um, with NASFA, with all the different states that would get together and talk in roundtable formats or just anytime there was an opportunity to kind of share ideas and um, learning a lot about how all the states were managing uh, you know, sometimes we'd be on calls and some people were home, some people had already gone back to the office. And then a couple months later, it flip-flopped and it was the other way uh, with different people. So it was really good to sort of learn really real time what was going on in all the different states and ways of handling things. And then at the broader level, the, sh the, the share, and this is, sounds like a lot of platitudes, but just with the purchasing people at my state and with the technology people. So getting the PPE so we could run our buildings, getting the laptops, we could all be working from home, getting an updated telework policy. So those who could do their work from home, you know, had the ability to do that, plus do childcare and all those kind of things that were related, all kind of coming together. And that was just really, uh, a, you know, 
nothing like a crisis, you know, to really focus everybody and, you know, laser-like. So that was really, really good. Um, I do need to respond uh, to the comment about uh, cutting facilities budgets, <laughs> just in that um, we have, our buildings have been maybe, maybe 15 to 20% occupied, but our energy use has gone down maybe about 30%. So we have to still keep the buildings running for the people who do come in. Um, the other side of that is that everyone has been talking about how their own personal home water and energy use has gone up about 30% also. So it, it's been a, a, just a shifting of, of resources. Um, the whole work from home roller coaster, you know, has been uh, kind of a positive and a negative. You know, people have been uh, happy working at home, then they can't wait to go back. Then when they talk about going back, they say, oh, I don't want to go on the commute. So there's been a lot of um, real changes in terms of perspective on how to do your job and the different ways one can do the job. I mean, you can't be an electrician running a building from your home, um, but you can certainly manage some of the vendors from home and things like that. Um, one of the more unwelcome things I'd say is the crazy work hours that people have had to, to work, you know, and this is not just related to facilities, this is just, you know, everybody just trying to accommodate childcare, elder care, um, everyone's trying to work their required hours and there's been so much flexibility that uh, managers and leaders are always working so they could kind of respond to the, the flexible work schedules their staff is on. And um, I would say that um, the other thing that's been welcome is webcams. You know, I think that we didn't have, we, we were told not to use the cameras on our laptops when we were first given them. And now they're so key to having real good conversations with people because um, that visual piece is just so important to maintain some contact with people. So, you know, I'd say overall, um, the, the best part, the also in some of the worst parts and vice versa. So um, keep the, the one thing I'd say that's been the most challenging is the evolution of uh, practices to deal with keeping our buildings safe. You know, um, we, we're we still kind of waiting for some definitive guidelines on how to best maintain our buildings. You know, cleaning has gone, the cleaning protocols have been pretty consistent, um, but we've moved a little bit away from the surface cleaning. You know, we, we're still doing it, but we're not as nervous about it. You know, now we're all worried about what's in the air and how we're moving air around and things like that. And that's been, um, we, we would love for the science to catch up. You know, we know that's just, it's just going to take its time. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, one of the things I was surprised about Hope, and maybe I shouldn't have been given, you know, working with real estate for a long time, but is how many people wanted to take their chairs home with them, right? They're just, <laughs> <That's> huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. We let them. We let them if they wanted yep. to. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, Franklin, uh, let's talk a little bit about managing in this environment. So I know that NASPE has some uh, really interesting research I'm um, in this space and you know we know that one of the biggest challenges in managing is that kind of like middle management how do you how do you manage a, a highly mobile or remote workforce you know how do you keep everyone engaged um, what do you have any uh, any ideas any tips you can share with us here sure no I think that uh, and, and this has been a topic that uh, has been really a recurring theme amongst uh, NASB members for quite some time about how do we step into this mobile work uh, environment in a, a thoughtful way. Um, I think public sector always has a challenging dynamic in that we could have competitors, whether it's IT or elsewhere. Um, certainly here in the Pacific Northwest, we have quite a few, um, you know, large employers that have historically been really flexible on work arrangements, while um, I think understanding public sector always has that dynamic of um, uh, accountability, public perception, and try how can we meet some of the flexibility that our, that our employees are looking for and new employees to the market are looking for more and more in terms of expectations around flexibility from their employer. And certainly NASB has you know, talked quite a bit about, I think the challenge that we see in the middle of our organization sometimes is that our middle managers are always, and I hope I spoke to some of this even in the more recent era, but the dynamic of Often we look to our middle managers, or, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but the people in the middle of our organization to be the executor, the change management, the leaders on kind of what we're doing to execute strategic vision and the next stage in terms of 
improvement in our organizations and also managing day-to-day -day tasks, in many cases actually working alongside frontline employees. Um, and so it's a tough situation to then, and we've seen this over the years, to then say, do all of that, kind of be torn between these two lives, and then also deal with everyone not being in the office. And, you know, understandably, culturally some, you know, we, we are accustomed to managing by seeing. So being comfortable not seeing people is something we've had seen challenges on. We, um, we have in many of our member states and including Washington have looked at how we can do trainings to help with tools to um, uh, keep engagement. Um, and I think it was going okay. Uh, but then of course the past few months happened and then we just, everyone got home. It was like, get them home, get them safe. And in some ways that was like, it was this moment that I think we now have this revitalization of this can be done. Um, I think that um, a huge shout out to, I think, IT across, I think every member state on the calls that we have, we have regular calls, have talked about how great their IT shops have been to get IT resources out to staff as best as they can. And um, I think that that's uh, really been a, a great step in the right direction, but I think we uh, hope nicely capture the challenge we have of how do we help our supervisors and managers um, stay engaged with employees as they're kind of dispersed and even working different schedules as well. Um, we have really uh, developed, in Washington, we've we developed more and more guidelines to kind of help our managers be more okay with the flexibility, to give them kind of the authorization to, um, uh, again, I think provide some flexibility, uh, step into a little more of kind of some of the uncertainty, um, not letting performance expectations fall by the wayside, but being a bit more flexible in how things get done. Um, so I think really reinforcing that it's not every little detail of how it's done, but how, the fact that it gets done um, is something that I think we really tried to, to work with. Um, you know, I, I never thought I would say in my life that we were talking about telework as a health imperative. Um, you know, we talked about it as, in many states talked about how valuable it was for being competitive as an employer, um, for getting access to more diverse applicant pools, if your area of your employment is not, and of course, the diverse communities. Um, but I never thought I would be saying to, it's a matter of life and death <laughs> that you get your employees home to work remotely. And that's what we were doing in March. We were talking about how, you know, this was a matter of getting people home and keeping them safe, minimizing how many people were out so that the people who had to be out were out, um, but not exposed to additional uh, risk of community spread. Um, and I think even now as we reopen more and more, we, we've tried to do that in a very thoughtful way of, um, we developed some tools to help really identify who's not thriving at home. So are there work groups that are just not able to make this work? So taking a close look at the metrics you've used, identifying where they're falling short of those metrics and how you could then begin to bring them into work a little bit more. Not even 100%, but maybe finding those days where you can come in and have a few check-in points with yeah. small groups where it's socially appropriate, but not get so... Um, not bring everyone back in, but actually be careful about you bring the people back in and our safe start guidance are really clear about this, that you find out who you need to get back in to get the work done. And those are the ones that you focus on. Not that they could come in. If they're able to come in, but they're able to work just fine at home, let's have them stay home right now. Um, and let's focus on the ones that are not thriving. And so yeah. we developed some tools to really help with that. And I think that helped our managers feel better that we were authorizing that, that we were supportive of that. And we laid that out in a lot of our safe start guidance that we published to our agencies. Um, and that seemed to help, um, I think, people navigate that. I hope that gets yeah, to some of the points you wanted to cover, but let me know. Yeah, if there's no, else no, that's there. great. That's great. Yeah, and I think there's this there's this theme of, hey, we're, we're all kind of learning as we go here. And what can we like immediately, what, you know, what do I know now that I can change tomorrow to make it better? And to the point, you know, uh, I think Brian made it earlier, use 80% act and adjust, right, move along. So so on that, along those same lines, thank you, um, Franklin, along those same lines, I'm going to go um, to Dennis and Hope next. So from an IT and a facilities perspective, um, what are the most critical changes that we have to make to face the future effectively? So asking you to get out your crystal ball here a little bit, but we've learned a lot in five months. Based on what you know now, what's, what's critical? So let's uh, start with Dennis. Oh, Brom, uh, the timing's pretty good on this question from an ASIO perspective because we it's a little less crystal ball than it might have been to even a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have uh, the our initial data from the, uh, the state, the national um, CIO survey. And so I'll, I'll read you a question. It sounds an awful lot like 
the one you just asked me. What business processes, practices, or investments will change post COVID-19? So I'll share the top six with you on our early data. One is expanded work from home and remote work options. So, you know, we want to keep making people more productive in their work at home capabilities. And, and we also want to make them more secure because the uh, you know, cybersecurity is, is a different challenge with all those endpoints spread all across the, uh, the state, in some case, the country. In the world, we have, you know, we have folks from in other countries working in the network as well. Uh, the expanded use of collaboration platforms is number two, remote meetings. And, you know, here we are on a, on a Zoom, you know, so it's, it's great that we have these and we, we need to get better at using them. We need to find better ways of leveraging the new capabilities that I'm sure the suppliers will come out with. Um, improving digital government services. Uh, we, we set the bar high by responding quickly, particularly in the areas of of you know supplying information with with AI chatbots and as, as well as um, you know the data analytics around what COVID was doing in communities, um, investments in broadband. The entire network everywhere is now critical infrastructure. You know my I w I don't think I would have considered my Comcast connection critical before, but now it kind of is. I can't you know it's part of how I work. Um, so, uh, increase number five, increase priority and investment in legacy modernization. And that's very heavily focused on the unemployment insurance area because some states, even though there was a problem back in 2008 to seven, eight, nine, when we had our economic downturn, um, the, the departments of labor or those entities that were responsible for unemployment didn't all get you know, get religion on scaling and, and, and modernizing. And that's caused states a lot of problems. So we, you know, we need to keep working on that. And then uh, number six is expanding cloud services. Uh, to the extent that um, states had cloud service options, um, it, made, it made it easier for them to move people out. Um, you know, it, for example, if you had, most states had uh, not enough VPN capacity to, to support all of their, uh, I see a, a hope nodding her head there. And I, I know that I, there's not a state that had as much VPN as they needed, but if they had cloud services already in place, um, they didn't need the VPN uh, for a lot of the things they had to do. They might have needed it for some of them, but not all of them. So they're, you know, those are just the top six. You'll that, yeah. that will be published um, soon. So we'll be able to see, and, and it's a valuable tool for not only CIOs, but public policy folks to know what's going on in technology, so. Yeah, thank you. All right, Hope, how about you? What, what are the changes needed from a facilities the perspective? The for us is thinking about how we use our state buildings. You know, I think that the fact is we probably will not ever go back to full, like that, that dense, dense occupancy we had before, we, but there will still be a need for a place for people to go into an office on occasion and that, we might be able to do more of the hoteling and more sharing of spaces and having a little bit less density, but maybe being able to get out of some of our state leases and things like that to sort of bring more, um, more of our functions into a more of a central location and just how to really re or restructure the building and how the building can provide space for important government services and whether they be public facing or back office and things like that. So I think it's the, it's, really modernizing the workforce and planning for a, a different kind of uh, delivery of physical space for people to uh, do their jobs uh, from where they can do their jobs. Um, and I'll just say the other thing is, I think there still is gonna be a need for personal contact along the way. You know, I think the Zoom is great. I think you know, the webcam is great, but it's not the same. I think that what, what the NASCA has done with, with the learning series is awesome. And we, you know, NASCA had to cancel its conference this year. We've tried to make up for it with other approaches. Um, we have great connections. People really are learning from one another. It's not the same. <laughs> so um, just think that we have to still, and hopefully we can plan for a future where there are chances for people to really be in a room together. Yeah. Okay. Great. And I, I know that we're we're at time here. I just want to just throw out just one last question. Not everyone has to jump in, but um, anything over the last few months, um, uh, like where you did something and you wished you would have done it differently. And I, we could probably need to keep these to like one one sentence answers. But anybody want to weigh in? Weigh in on that? So, Brom, one thing that I wish I had done differently is make emotional investments it, with my staff 
earlier rather than later, um, but I can turn it around to a positive. As, as we made those emotional investments in my subordinate managers, but also my peers, I think we've got some very positives uh, that have come out of it. And I'll drop a few names and, and these folks will know those names. Uh, Shannon Ryan and Jeremy Miller uh, guided our facilities and spun up a PPE warehouse in seven days. It went from dark to completely lit uh, in seven days. And that includes the work that Terrence and JB did on the, the CIO side. Um, and, and, and working with each other. If there had not been built in trust, then, then nothing positive could have happened. Or with Debbie Dennis, my CPO, who is now one of the biggest rock stars in Oregon and is called on directly by the governor's office and many of the state agencies uh, because she is a problem solver. And, uh, you know, I think about Madeline Zyke down in CHRO and the investments and the training that I got from her on how to make these emotional investments uh, in my staff. Um, I think, you know, I withdrew all of those investments in the, in the middle of the crisis and we did some really wonderful things. But I think the most important thing, and this is gonna get back to Hope's point and to Franklin's point about those personal connections. I ended every phone call with, um, with Shannon, our, our facilities guru. I ended every phone call with, how is your dad doing? I ended every phone call with Debbie on how is your daughter doing right now? I know that there are special needs going on and this has got to be a scary time with COVID. And so it always ended on a very personal touch so that my staff knew not only are we solving the problems of the state and, and uh, this, this um, pandemic crisis, but I care about you individually as well. And that every decision we make as a central agency impacts you directly as a person. So I wish we'd have just started those kinds of conversations before the pandemic had started. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, it, so I'm, I'm just going to apologize to the rest of the panelists. I think, you know, I'm already a couple minutes over here and I don't want that uh, shepherd's hook around my neck, at least not while everyone's watching. Um, so I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone on the panel today. Um, those were great updates, great insights. And again, you know, the, the relationship between NASCA and our, our sister associations is so important and we appreciate um, everyone being on here today. So with that, we'll, um, we'll wrap up this panel, but I also just wanted to thank everyone, um, you know, thank all of our attendees for joining uh, NASCA over the past three weeks for the Summer Thought Leadership Series. Uh, I know, you know, a lot, maybe not all of us have been able to join every single session, but you know, like me, the ones that we did join, um, it's been really excellent uh, to come together virtually, um, hear from thought leaders and meet colleagues from around the country. Um, this association is really well known for connecting individuals and we hope um, that the virtual experience has allowed us to do that, even though it's obviously a little different than, than what we normally do. Um, I also just wanna take a moment to thank the corporate council members uh, who generously supported this event. I know, you know moving from an in-person event uh, to something that's not in person, something that's a little bit different. There was probably some uh, concern there from the sponsors, but I know, you know the sponsors stuck with us through this and this wouldn't have been possible without your support. So again, thank you to the corporate sponsors. Um, and I also just wanna thank the working group, the virtual working group uh, for, the, you know, for all the work that they've done on these series. Um, like I said, replicating the same experience that you get from an in-person event um, it's, it's a challenge, uh, but I think, you know, based on what I've seen over the last uh, few sessions, it's been very successful and the speakers have been great and everyone is very engaged. So on behalf of NASCA and the executive committee, I want to thank each of you again for joining this summer series. Mm -hmm.